Jai Shri Ram. I was watching the movie Sant Nyaneshwar recently and it got me thinking about the way in which caste issues were solved during the period of the Bhakti movement and how that option is no longer open in the modern day. So this movie Sant Nyaneshwar is uh, from 1940, so very old black and white era. And it's in Marathi, which I don't understand a word of, but it had subtitles on YouTube, so I was able to just read those. Uh, and it's about Nyaneshwar, who was a bhakti movement saint that lived about uh, 800 years ago in present-day Maharashtra. He came from a Brahmin family, but he was treated like an outcast because his father had taken sannyas. Uh, and then he was persuaded to come back to his family from sannyas, and then more children were produced after that. So because of the fact that he was a product of this marriage and his father had broken the vows of sannyas, he and his uh, family were treated as outcasts. So watching this movie, uh, you see these different instances of him enduring this kind of uh, terrible treatment from people and the society around him and Fortunately, eventually, he's able to grow a following of lots of people from all different castes and classes and becomes quite a prolific figure in the Bhakti movement be before dying at a very young age. That's one of the things he's known for is that he uh, didn't live very long. Uh, but anyway, what this got me thinking of was the fact that if you look at Nyaneshwar or any of the other Bhakti movement saints from anywhere in the country, whether their god was Vithala, Krishna, Vishnu, Shiva or any other uh, deity, one thing that was common for pretty much all of them, or really all of them, at least the ones that I know, was that they had followers that came from all different castes. And people from low caste backgrounds, high caste backgrounds, middle, I mean, literally the entire gamut of different castes. And that when low caste people joined this movement, they found that their treatment got significantly better and, you know, people were not oppressing them and uh, practicing untouchability against them and so on and so forth. And what happened at that time in these situations were that people were treated equally because of the fact that they were brought into a new emerging fold, right? This new, uh, like the Warkari movement of Vitala or any of these uh, movements, again, all over the country, many different deities. And this happened over a period of centuries, uh, I think, as we all know, if you've studied the Bhakti movement. So instead of being treated like what we would call today a Dalit, these low caste people that came into these movements were treated as just another Bhakt of this deity, just another person that's involved in this. Um, sometimes they're kind of like Sampradayas, sometimes they're just movements. But anyway, they're part of this new emerging kind of Hindu fold that's across castes. And I think that this was the best, most reasonable, practical, and principled method to go about tackling this issue of uh, caste differences and discrimination and so on and so forth, in my view. And it had worked very well at that time. Now, I'm emphasizing the words was and had because I don't think that such a strategy is applicable at all in the modern day to tackle the issue of caste. And the reason for this is this shift is Dalit politics. Whether it's uh, Ambedkar and the movement he started in Maharashtra, whether it's EVR and the so-called self-respect movement in Tamil Nadu, whether it's Kanchi Ram and Maya with the NUP, or even more recently Chandrasekhar Azad Ramar in the Bhim Army, also in UP, all of these organizations in this new movement of Dalit politics, and by new I mean, you know, the last hundred years or whatever, uh, they have one thing in common, which is that they want Dalits to loudly and proudly assert this identity that they have and fight for recognition and special privileges to be awarded to them for being who they are, for, being, for coming from the background that they come from. What the Bhakti movement had done in the past was totally the opposite, was to break down the brown boundaries and bring people into a more unified Hindu fold. Whereas what the Dalit politics of today is seeking to do and is doing uh, is to continue to keep people apart and make them dig their heels into this identity, right? Not only are they successful at deepening and strengthening this Dalit identity, but they've also been successful at crafting it in the first place. Because if you think about it, the word Dalit 
or Harijan, uh, it doesn't exist in any scripture. It's a modern term. Terms that exist are, you know, Chandala and so many other words that, you know, they may mean outcast. They may uh, refer to people who do a certain job. They may be the name of a particular caste, so on and so forth, right? There was never a pan-Indian idea that all of these different groups are one, like, for example, there was with Brahmins. If you go back in history, people always understood who Brahmins were across India, no matter what language they spoke, what region they're from, and so on. They were seen as being one group of people across the country, even though they, of course, had all of these different individual Brahmin jatis in different places, and even within one locale, you have money... Uh, multiple different Brahmin Jatis. Um, Dalits never had this kind of an identity or consciousness. They were always just part of particular localized Jatis that due to the profession that they did and the food habits that they had, people from the mainstream society practiced untouchability towards them. They didn't develop this sense of a consciousness that all people across India who are part of communities uh, that have had similar situations to what they have faced were all one. But now, because of the Dalit politics of the modern day, they do have that. And once you separate yourself away, or once people separate themselves away from you, uh, from the rest of the population and affirm this kind of an identity, then there's really no way of bringing them back into the fold of mainstream Hindu society, because they're basically saying... By they, I mean those who are actually into Dalit politics, not, you know, 25% of the population at large, but those who are into this. They're basically saying they don't want to be part of the mainstream Hindu society. They're saying we are who we are, you people are oppressing us, and so on. Now, there are many people that have uh, talked about the fact that Dalits who have become urbanized actually are becoming mainstream. Dalits leave the villages that they are from to, and move to cities where people don't know the particular castes of whichever region of another state that they come from, right? I mean, if someone moves to Mumbai from rural Bihar, people in Mumbai don't know what the caste discriminate, the caste dynamics and the names of caste and who's a landowner and who's this and who's that. They don't know that in Mumbai. They would know it in terms of their locality in Western Maharashtra, not in Bihar, right? So, you know, they come to the cities and the economy and the social dynamics of city life are really not at all connected to caste in any way. And so Dalits in these that move to these cities are becoming assimilated into the mainstream. This is a uh, narrative that we often hear if you're involved in the discourse and you look at what other people are saying. This is something that gets said a lot. Now, I personally have my doubts about this kind of a narrative, to be quite honest, because wherever I hear this idea being pushed, it's often directly connected with support for the BJP, that somehow, because of the fact that SCST vote share for the BJP is increasing over time, uh, this is a meaningful indication of their assimilation into the broader Hindu identity. But we've often seen under this government an extreme... Well, but... Uh, we have seen it under this government an extreme strengthening of the SCST Act, which has led to a lot of cases uh, gaining, you know, news coverage and all of that. And we've also seen, you know, these quote unquote atrocity stories of, oh, someone claim some Dalit in like UP or something claims that Rajputs came, beat him up and shaved his mustache or something like, right? You hear these kinds of stories about growing a mustache or you know, in the past, you'd hear these stories about riding a bicycle through all these various things that, according to some very orthodox kind of, uh, you know, set of rules, they're not supposed to be doing in a kind of village environment or whatever. It Part of that, I think, is social media. But again, strengthening of the SCST Act has nothing to do with social media. This is a political kind of a thing. So I don't really buy into this argument that Dalits are becoming really mainstreamed and we don't really have to worry about this uh, problem of Dalit politics and continuing to engender this kind of a division in the society because again like I said Dalit people who are Dalits trying to at assert their rights as a unique group is a very new thing in Hindu society it's only existed in the last hundred years or so 
in the past, when people were trying to overcome this kind of caste discrimination, they wanted to become assimilated into the mainstream Hindu fold, and that's reducing. And another thing to keep in mind, I think, is also that people who feel oppressed in terms of their psyche, but they are not actually oppressed in terms of their normal life, they're the ones that are much more uh, a danger when it comes to this kind of a thing, right? Like someone who, you know, someone who comes from a Dalit caste, who was born and raised in a city, they're educated, they never actually faced any real discrimination, and they may have benefited from reservations and things like that. Those are the people that hear, you know, they hear stories of what their parents or their, you know, relatives in the village had to go through, and they get kind of quote unquote radicalized and they see someone like Chandrasekhar Azad Raman uh, out there in the news and online and they think, you know, this is, you know, this is my kind of guy. This is the kind of movement that I need to support. I think that that kind of uh, thing is just going to continue to increase because again, or not again, um, identity is something that you feel and you look at and you identify with. It's not so much founded upon your real life experiences. And so if people feel that they are part of a certain group and they feel that that group is being disadvantaged or oppressed by some other group, then they're going to act out accordingly and they're going to move the discourse in that way. The trying to show them that this is not the case or trying to show them that this is the way forward or whatever the case may be, that doesn't actually have any effect. So I hope that this kind of uh, starts some more conversation on this kind of a thing, because I think that when it comes to caste, we have basically two different uh, extremes of people that you hear. You have one side that's, you know, like Ambedkarite and they think caste is bad. Then you have another side that thinks caste is not even Indian or Hindu. And it's, you know, we have Warna Jati and this isn't caste. And you hear this long story. And I feel that a lot of people don't really want to talk about this issue in a sense where we're trying to figure out or, you know, shape the future, whatever the case may be, uh, in an honest way that's actually practical. Which again, like I said, what the Bhakti movement did with respect to caste was very practical and effective. So that's all I've got for you guys today. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Jai Sri Ram.